I kind of wanted to go through what, what I saw from my perspective across Saskatchewan and share some of those ideas with you. Um, more so in 012, this was by far the one year where no one individual event causes significant yield loss. And in past years, it could have a cutworm issue that can take a little bit away. Um, this year, there were two main ones that really hit us hard. One being sclerotinia and the other one being aster yellows. So I'll go into both of those as the two main contributing factors to why the yields were not where they were supposed to be last year. But there were also a l couple small ones that, that took away from canola and what we thought would be, would be better yields. So kind of here's how the year played out and a little bit of a spoof here on the game on thing that we have. This is uh, more or less what I'll talk about, early season plant development, our conditions in July, what our growing season was like. And then our sclerotinia rotation, aster yellows, and where flea beetles, cutworms, and bertha haven't really caused a whole bunch of troubles, but they're still on our radar and they're continuous problems. When you look at where we were last year going into what happened to yields, we had relatively shallow roots with an excellent spring moisture. And what I mean by that is we had a good root system on it, but it wasn't very deep. It was a lot of lateral roots because the moisture was right at the surface. We didn't have to really tap down until later in the season in July. By that time, the plants had already established them. <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, had already established themselves with a relatively wet June. The roots didn't have to go down. They grew laterally, grew very well, had big crops. But when July hit, we had a lot of negative stuff incurring that. In other words, we did see some flower blast. We didn't see that pod and pollen development that was normally happen with the high temperatures we had. You combine that with some areas with flea beetles. They did take a toll on some guys' fields. They were present. And cutworms as well slowed down overall plant development. We've seen a real a species shift of stripe flea beetles over the last 10 years, and flea beetles are continuous, continuing to be an issue. Um, our seed treatments are doing everything they're supposed to be, but we're still seeing more and more flea beetles present, and if this spring here looks like it probably isn't going to be a case because we're very, very wet, they may not be an issue, but there are areas that dealt with a lot of flea beetle damage, surprisingly enough. I did see, and there were some areas in the Moose Jaw area and in the Swift Current area that had some early season diamondback uh, damage that was taking place at the bud stage, it went unnoticed for the most part. I know I talked to Lee, there were a few guys spring for diamondbacks at bud stage, but a lot of guys weren't even aware that they were here. They came in, in on early season winds uh, from the south, and they were taking away some bud florets and chewing on them and actually causing some significant damage before they were even recognized. So they're an insect. If we have another year like we had last year, poor crop in the U.S., the diamondbacks don't have the food source they need down there to stay there. We get those predominantly southern winds and the airflow, we could end up with a huge diamondback infestation very early again this year as well. So keep your eyes open for, flea, for uh, diamondback moss. So when you took a look at June 15th, we were about 10 to 12 days behind in our normal plant <coughs> development. Not necessarily a bad thing depending on the fall, but it did come back to bite us a little bit once we got into July. So those hot humid conditions combined with those shallower roots, we just couldn't keep that above portion of the plant satisfied with what it needed. When July rolled around and we had to start seed fill and flowering and all the things that occur in August, those roots, although they were big, they weren't deep enough to supply all the nutrients and moisture that those crops needed to have. And we didn't see all that fill that we need to normally do. And that was a function of the environment. environment. Pollination and pod formation, of course, was impacted by that. And the biggest thing was it's the first time in my life I've ever lived in Manitoba, but I never left Saskatchewan. July was hot and humid and moist. The perfect conditions for a lot of things to go wrong. And we had tremendous amount of southerly winds. And for those that have ever seen the Tornado Hunter guy, he's done a few meetings with us. Um, last I heard is his potential is he's going to spend about 60% of his time back up in here in Saskatchewan next year telling us we're going to have a lot of those same conditions. So we're going to have those warm, humid temperatures in July again, which is favorable for thunderstorms and all those other great things that come along with that. So, so it was an impact. <coughs> so sclerotinia, I mentioned, was the one of the major factors that contributed to yield loss. In the past two years, has warned us that these risks are very high. We've had a buildup of inoculum since 2010. I thought 2010 was a bad enough year, but 011 and 012 were just as bad in terms of inoculum. We've got a tremendous amount of sclerotia bodies in the ground right now, and we have a whole host of different crops. Lentil crops, for example, have definitely been impacted by that. 
So I guess the question around is that what if, what, so what if we would have sprayed last year? There were fields that were sprayed and still had over 20% infection. There are other fields that weren't sprayed and it was all over the map. I saw fields anywhere from 5 to 8% infected all the way up to 100% of the plants had sclerotinny on it. And all the things that I know about canola in my lifetime, when it went into that 5th and 8th and 10th of July, knowing how canola, sh how sclerotinia develops in a plant, I did not think it would be as bad as it possibly was. And what, in what really hit that hard was the fact that we had that hot, humid conditions throughout that flowering period for the most part that I was still wet up to my waist in thick lush canopy of canola and we had enough moisture and subsoil moisture to keep the canopy right full of moisture and it really took a, its toll in terms of sclerotinia far more than I ever thought of. I didn't think a fungicide would be warranted on a lot of fields because it got so dry so quick but it totally changed the way I looked at how the disease develops. <coughs> so here I just want to go a snapshot back in time to show you where our risks are going into 2013, okay? And sclerotinia, traditionally, we used to think about it in this kind of a belt here, anything north of that line. In the last five to eight years, it now encompasses almost every ground we've got in Saskatchewan. We've got some level of sclerotinia in a lot of areas. You guys are no different than anybody else. And when you look at where we were in 2010 in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, we had 92% of the fields in Saskatchewan, and this is a provincial survey. 012, I think there's a bit of an issue with it. 23% of the plants were infected with a severity of 2.7. And that's critical because more and more extension people are going to talk about severity, and industry participants will as well. The 23% of the plants were infected, and that 2.7 is critical because anything over 1.8 means there's significant uh, impact to yield. In other words, there was a big yield loss. So the higher that number, the more the yield loss was there. This scale in the case of severity goes up to five. So well over a half, which means there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of sclerotinia and bad sclerotinia in 2010. It was also a very wet year, nothing like we had in 2012. So we built up an oculum in 010. In 011, very much the same. Not quite as bad, but we still were surprised. We had an awful lot of fields, still having a lot. 81% of the fields had it, but the incidence was only 9.4, but we still had a lot of severe sclerotinia. So another year where we added more inoculum to the ground. We go into 2012, and overall in Saskatchewan, we had 21% incidence, severity of 2.8. We're seeing that continuously go up, but you look in areas of west, west central Saskatchewan, and this encompasses a line anywhere from basically watchers down through into this area here. We were 29% at 3.2. And on the eastern side, we were 91% at the same thing. I'm not necessarily believing that these are exact, exact um, accurate numbers because the fields that I were in were a lot worse than this. And I walk into a field of canola where I'm finding far worse than 22%. You got to remember this is an average. So for if they're saying here, our incidence was 21%, that means that our whole bunch of fields were at 40% incidence and a whole bunch of them that were at zero. Almost every field that I was in had some level of sclerotinia in it. So we had a tremendous amount of inoculum buildup. It's not going to go away. Sclerotinia will continue to be a bigger issue. So that's we got to think about in terms of other crops, in terms of beans and lentils and other crops that are host crops or can also be impacted by white mold. There is only one species. Okay. So sclerotinia was by far the worst indicator for this. <coughs> Excuse me here, southeast Saskatchewan. So where we go into 2013, and I've had this question by a number of guys, um, you know, what do, I, what do I factor in? Do I, do I spray? And all indications for me right now on what's happened the last three years and what I think will occur this year based on the moisture we've got not knowing what it's going to be like in July, but I'm guessing a fungicide is going to be a must, irregardless of what you're using, simply because the risks are too high not to. Guys that spray got good yields, but guys that didn't spray were terribly disappointed when they only got 26, 28 bushel an acre, when there was well over 40 bushel acre crop there, and sclerotinia really, really hammered our canola crops bad this year. So and it, anything, that's especially pea or lentil ground, is a must. We've noticed that the last few years and recognize that, especially lentil ground. 
Anybody putting canola in lentil ground because of the host? The inoculum doesn't have to go anywhere, guys. It's right there in the ground. It just has to come up out of the ground and infect your canola crop. The majority of, of, of spore flow from sclerotinia tends to be from the next quarter sections over. So if you've got a quarter section in the middle, it's the ones around you, the predominantly where most of that comes from. So the more acres we got, and we've had a lot of acres the last few years, there's an oculum everywhere. It doesn't have to go very far to infect our canola crops. Okay, and because they last seven years, we've had three years of a lot of inoculum buildup. We had a long time to break that down over time. So after three, you know, question is what if I don't use genetic resistance or use a fungicide? So what are the risks of getting sclerotinia as well? <coughs> it's huge. I think a fungicide is a necessity this year based on what I've seen and it's just going to be a must. So a sclerotinia is most likely going to be another problem for us this year. It's not 100% because it can change, but everything I've seen prior to and learned the last few years definitely looks like we're going to have some issues. So the other big thing that happened in canola was the aster yellows. Um, has anybody not seen aster yellows? I still ask that question because I do run into a couple people that don't. But um, we've learned a lot about aster yellows in the last couple of years, especially this year, I'm working with Crystal Oliver on this. Um, we had a huge migration of these six spotted leaf hoppers from the U.S. Because of the drought in the U.S. and the lack of food, they migratoried up here very early and as well as they were infected to a higher degree than they normally are. And in, in, ex, uh, in excess of 70% of them were already infected when they actually migrated up here. So they were already at that point where they were going to be contagious. We have the actual mycoplasma-like organism itself that's here. <coughs> it hosts on a, hundreds of different species. It's very prevalent, but it doesn't do anything until it has that little leaf hopper come along and actually chew on the plant and spread it from plant to plant to plant. Leaf hoppers do not really like canola. They prefer cereals. That's their favorite crop of choice is cereals, not canola. But we don't really see it in cereals that much. We predominantly notice it in canola, but this year was by far the worst year where we saw it in every crop. And there were a lot of cereals, the whiteheads on, on derm and cereals, that was a result of aster yellows. So how this works by this insect is that this little leaf hopper, as it goes on a plant that's infected with this mycoplasma-like organism, it chews and sits there and eats. Okay? As it ingests it into its stomach, it basically cultures inside the midgut of this insect. Then as he goes and he moves from the next plant, it may also be infected. And then what happens is he'll move to a plant that's not infected, like a canola plant, and as he starts to chew and suck on the plant, he regurgitates that and puts it into the plant to actually cause that infection of aster yellows. But if you think of the numbers and how this was all going to work, that each one of these little leaf hoppers have to spend eight hours on one infected plant just in order for them to get 50% infected. So you think of the sheer numbers of leaf hoppers that had to have been present last year to cause the level of aster yellows and how much they were infected or how long they had to feed was unfathomable. There was, there was a tremendous amount of them across Western Canada and a huge number of them that came up. So it was a bad deal. Here's the aster yellow survey, where we were at. 77% of the fields had it. The average incidence was 10.1%. Depending where you were in East Central Saskatchewan, I think I've got another one here in Southeast Saskatchewan, if I've got West Central. Um, <coughs> the normal rule of thumb with aster yellows, if you go through and count your plants and you get 20% infected, your yield loss is the same as it would be for sclerotinia, about half. So your yield, your yield loss would be 10%. 20% of your plants have aster yellows, your yield loss would be 10%. I think there was something we, weren't, we learned last year, and we did some investigation on this, that I noticed there was varying levels of the disease present. And what I initially thought to this was, was more or less around the disease wasn't developing itself, but it wasn't so much in terms of what it was doing. It was, it was a bigger impact of when it was actually infected. <coughs> and we learned this, that the plants that we saw last year that were at those complete bladder-like witch's broom, didn't set hardly any seed, those were infected at the one to two leaf stage. So when that crop came out in the first couple, first few days of June or the end of May, those leaf hoppers were already here, already feeding. 
which is a little bit unusual. They're not normally here that early, but because of the situation last year with the U.S. drought and the strong southerly flows, they were here earlier last year. So we saw a larger portion of our plants like this because they were already here infecting and chewing on them. This plant, which is the ones that, that, that totally threw me off when I'm looking, I had a plant here that was infected at the bolting stage. There were no signs of aster yellows anywhere on that plant. It didn't look like it was setting much for seed. It looked like there was a little bit of some characteristics of aster yellows, but it wasn't right till the very end we saw these little buds right at the very end, the bladder show up. That was actually an infection that took place at the bolting stage. So when that plant was bolting, the insects were there and caused it to impact the plant, but it didn't cause as much yield damage. This plant here that looked like a normal plant, it just wasn't setting any seed and all of a sudden right at the very end to put the bladders, I saw a lot of plants looking like this. They look like crap. And we th were thinking nutrients, some other thing, when it was in essence an aster yellows infection at the three to five leaf stage. So it caused a number of different characteristics on that plant. And one that we noticed for sure is these purpling leaves. I found plants that had nothing but not great, great form pods, but we had a lot of these leaves that had this real purple, irregular shaped margins on them, looked really, really goofy. That's classic aster yellows, but that was the only symptom we saw until the plants put the bladders out at the end. So what I'm thinking and what I observed in the field is that impact aster yellows was far greater than we thought. 10% of our yield was gone, <coughs> at least due to aster yellows with various degrees. And there's nothing we can do about it, unfortunately. There were some guys with some anecdotal stuff that actually they went in and they were putting on insecticides on for different insects early on at that one to two leaf stage. They didn't find the same level of aster yellows that other guys did. And that tends to hold back to what we were talking about earlier was that infection that caused all those ones to really be badly infected with all the bladders. It was an infection that was taking place at the one to two leaf stage when the actual leaf hoppers were there chewing. Guys were controlling another insect that actually benefited that and they weren't seeing the aster yellows. The problem with that is in order to get rid of it, you'd have to spray Monday, Wednesday, and Friday the whole month of June. It just isn't practical. The insect is very migratory, and what you do on Monday, two days later, they'll be, migra they'll be migrating into your field. You will get penalized for being a good farmer with aster yellows with the leaf hopper. They prefer really even maturing fields, <coughs> and that's what they're attracted to. They're attracted to really even maturity, all the same plant stage, that's what seems to be attractive for the leaf hoppers. So if you've still got a 20 year old drill and your canola looks a little ratty, that's sometimes a good thing. So, But the risk going into 2013 is going to be like every year. We just don't know what it's going to be. We honestly don't know. But based on what the weather patterns are and we know that we think there may be some overwintering of the actual leaf hopper, but they're not a significant number to cause any big overall yield losses to it, but if we get that southerly flow again, we should be prepared for more aster yellows. Okay? So one thing about it, because we know they prefer grasses, a good thing that you'll want to keep in mind is keeping your weeds, your fields uh, weed free as much as you possibly can. That's certainly a positive. In other words, don't let your grasses get too out of control irregardless of what system you're using because that's more attractive to the leaf hopper than canola, so keep that in mind. And then flea beetles, I'm thinking depending on this year, most likely won't be for most areas, we're over wet. Cutworms are the same risk as always. <coughs> We've seen some pretty wet years where cutworms have caused a lot of problems. Keep in mind, especially coming off of pulses, uh, off of pea ground or lentil ground. Um, we've got a new product that we're working on with DuPont. Is it going to be talked about today? That'll, the new Siazapur. Yeah. Okay, it'll be covered. I won't talk about it. There's some stuff that's... No, I'm not really going to talk other than we've got some products we're now worked with. We've got that actually have really good control of cutworms. So we've got some new products that'll actually benefit there. Uh, Bertha, this one here is a bit of an interesting one. Uh, this was from 2012. These were our hot spots in July, and now where we are here down at Moose Joe, which is right here, this pocket did not, de did not develop into a great big problem last year. We were very surprised with this. We caught an awful lot of moss and an awful lot of traps, but we did not have to spray. The big benefit that came from that was the natural uh, 
parasitoids that came along with insects is that when they start to increase, there's a lot of really beneficial insects that control their populations naturally. They did a great job last year. Berthas were basically controlled by that viral infection that caused them to wilt on the plant. We saw fields that were right at threshold, but just when they get to be at or near the threshold for control, the Berthas were dying off for getting this viral infection. So that's a good positive thing coming out of it. But Berthas normally because they're cyclic, we haven't had another year. We've got this increase again back to where we are. So 013, we anticipate this to be a little larger and then it'll start to drop off. So you guys are kind of on fringe areas for Berthas. But keep in mind, they're a monitorable insect and they're easy to control. So other than another trip through the field. So any questions about watchouts? It's unfortunate and you know, sclerotinio, we have, we have tools in place, we can control it. <coughs> Excuse me. But the Aster Yellows is one that just, it frustrates me that we don't have those levels of control and it's an insect that's migratory and uh, we just don't have enough information. We're not looking at breeding for, fight for the mycoplasma, like or nothing that's on our radar because they just traditionally are not a big problem. Sclerotinia is manageable, but we've got so much inoculum we need to manage it from a perspective that everybody's going to have to start spraying, unfortunately. It's just the economics dictate us having to. There's one crop we'd like to not spray. We're hoping it's canola. We're working on that to get 100% sclerotinia resistance. We're not quite there yet. Our material's getting closer and we're still looking for that one that'll basically replace a fungicide application. But we're still not at that point. But fields even with fungicides, we probably should have sprayed twice last year. That would have been our best approach, but how would have we have known? We're traditionally not a sclerotinia area for the most part, but we soon are becoming it because we've got more canola, we've got more crops that host the disease, and it's just a function of what we're going to have to manage. So, uh, Yeah, where, where we're going to be going is we're going to have Liberty Link canola. There's a few things we're working on. Of course, with DuPont, we've got some chemistries that are coming down the line, and one of them is cutworm control. I mentioned that briefly. Uh, we're also, we're going to, I talked earlier about shadow resistance. We're looking at that in our PAT trials right now. We hope to have a variety registered in a couple years in that. We're also going to have Liberty Link canola as well in our portfolio. Uh, that will be coming out in 014. We'll have actual PAT trials or we'll be looking at it. Our reps will be looking at our own Liberty Link system. And then our other big uh, jump coming up will be Optimum Gly. So Optimum Gly will be going into 015, 016, where that's our own proprietary glyphosate gene. <coughs> and what I mean by that is right now everybody in the Roundup Pretty industry uses that technology for Monsanto. We have our own proprietary glyphosate gene that allows us not to do that anymore. And there's some huge benefits that come along with that is one of them is being around the tolerance issues. With the Roundup Ready 1 gene, there's issues around when you can spray the crop. And we always say don't spray past the six leaf because of tolerance. We see some of those blanks in the main stem we've talked about over the years. We see a wider window of application occurring with our, with our own new glyphosate gene, with, gly, with Optimum Gly, as well as the rates will change. So we'll be able to control harder to kill weeds. We'll be able to use higher rates of glyphosate if needed. But those options are going to be available to us. So that's a good thing. So the Liberty Link canola will be a huge thing because the reps will in the next couple of years have that in their portfolio along with not only early Roundup Clearfield, then we'll have Liberty as well as a one-stop shopping, so to speak. <laughs>